morning, everybody, and welcome to Mediation, the New Possibilities Hour. Today is December 17th, 2020, and this is our last broadcast of 2020. We have a tremendous presentation this morning with Ken Cloak. As everyone knows, this is part of the Will Work for Food project. We don't charge for these great webinars. Rather, we ask you to contribute to a food bank if you like what you see. And how can you not? Natalie Armstrong Motan, who's in France, organized the Will Work for Food project in the spring when the lockdowns began. And I'm so happy she invited me to join in the effort. One of my favorite parts of the New Possibilities Hour every week is to ask Natalie how we're doing so far in terms of how much money we have raised for food banks through the generosity of all of you who watch these webinars. Natalie, how are we doing this week? Jeff, we're doing fantastic this week. We have just touched the $63,000 mark in worldwide donations. And I have to say when this happened, the, the, the COVID issue and food bank necessity happened way back in March, I thought that you and I would do a handful of programs, six, eight, maybe 10 different programs, the month of May, maybe stretching into April a little bit, now we are wrapping up 2020 and uh, when you and I originally started all of this, we thought, oh, 500, maybe $1,000 in donations. Now we've hit $63,000 wow. in donations and we're booking into 2021 now. We've got some fantastic speakers for 2021, so we hope people will continue to join us. That's right. We'll be starting back on January 7th with Professor Peter Robinson of Pepperdine Law School on the subject of apology and forgiveness in mediation. We have other tremendous speakers lined up for 2021. Dean Elsong Richardson of UC Irvine Law School will be talking about implicit bias and what to do about it. Grace Hansen, who's the head of claims at Hiscox in London, will be talking about what mediators need to understand about the London markets, London insurance markets. We have many, many other great speakers coming up on a wide variety of topics. And we're so happy that people respond so positively. So now to today's program. Ken Cloak is a living legend in the world of mediation. He's probably one of the most, if not the most beloved people in our, our field. Uh, everybody just loves Ken Cloak. I remember early in my own mediation career, one of my waning days as an advocate, having hired Ken to mediate a case. And I learned so much from Ken way back then and uh, was inspired. Ken, you were one of the inspirations for me to undertake this wonderful career. And I, I owe you an eternal debt of gratitude for that and so many other things. Your leadership in the field is magnificent. Ken, we give every speaker an opportunity to mention a particular food bank that's important to them, where you'd like people to direct contributions if they're in a, a position to uh, make a contribution. So uh, with that, uh, my friend, the floor is yours. Please mention a food bank and we'd love to hear what you have to say. Thank you, Jeff, and thank you, Natalie. And it's wonderful to see so many people who I know and uh, admire and uh, respect deeply. Um, many of our histories are intertwined going back many, many years now. Uh, and that feels really wonderful to just see uh, friends again. Um, Sabine, uh, it's wonderful to see you. We haven't seen each other in a long time. Uh, I would like to actually mention two food banks. Um, one is the Ocean Park Community Center, um, a project of the Ocean Park Community Organization in Santa Monica. Um, and the second uh, is uh, a food bank that is located in um, North Idaho. Um, in a little town called Sandpoint uh, that feeds homeless people uh, in uh, a variety of uh, different locations. It began really with the uh, North Idaho Head Start uh, organization and it's run by a woman whose name is Susan Edwards. And I'd like to give honorable mention uh, not to a food bank but to two people who have been working to deliver food to the homeless for many, many decades, um, Susan Clark and Peter Evans. 
Uh, they're both professors at the Annenberg School at the University of Southern California. Uh, and they have uh, uh, done something really unusual, which is not just to stock food banks with traditional uh, sort of um, unhealthy foods, but to find ways of providing fresh fruits and vegetables uh, to people who need something that is nutritious um, and not just something that uh, is filling. So uh, Susan Edwards and uh, 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 Peter Clark uh, have really done a, a wonderful job of doing this and they've developed an app uh, which is available online um, that helps food banks figure out how to find fresh uh, nutritious food uh, for the people who work with them. Thank you. A pleasure. And thank you for doing this. And now and the, floor, the floor is yours, please. Oh, okay, okay. So I think we want to begin actually um, by acknowledging uh, the fact that we are living in a period of crisis. And in the midst of this crisis, there are many, many people around the world who are way worse off than we are. Uh, people who do not have enough to eat. Um, people who are living at the edge uh, of survival. And I think it's important to begin by acknowledging those people um, and dedicating our work uh, to making sure that their suffering is reduced. So what I'd like to talk to you about today um, is language, the language of conflict. And I'd like to uh, uh, describe a problem in conflict resolution, um, uh, which is the problem of scale, um, and then integrate that into language and connect it to um, political conflicts that we are all experiencing right now, um, and to uh, purely interpersonal and even internal conflicts within us. So the, the scientific term for this uh, is called a fractal. Uh, and a fractal is a fraction of a dimension. Um, a definition of a fractal is that it refers to something that is self-similar on all scales. So that you can look, for example, at a mountain range and the essential elements of the organization of that mountain range are the same uh, or look the same um, from a millionth of an inch uh, and um, a million feet. Um, the same can be said of a variety of different elements in the natural world. Uh, so the, the natural world is organized um, in ways that are simple, simple and easily generated and the easiest way to generate something is to have a pattern that replicates itself on all scales. So if we think about this for a moment, we can see that conflict is fractally organized. That is, there is something similar between conflicts uh, that take place um, between kids on a playground and the heads of nation states. And what we want to then figure out is what are those places of self-similarity? Um, another example, of, 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 in addition to the mountain range is the coastline of any country. And if you look closely at a coastline, again, it looks the same, essentially, from a very long distance away and a very uh, close distance. Um, what is it that looks the same in a coastline or a mountain range or a cloud um, or uh, any number of different um, forms of natural um, self-similarity? And uh, the answer is, I think, that there is a uh, relatively simple algorithm that is at work here. Something that is capable of um, repeating itself over and over again. Uh, it doesn't require much energy to generate it. So now I'd like to give an example on a small scale and on a large scale. 
uh, and use language as an example. So here is one word that will instantly produce divisions between us, instantly produce conflicts. Trump. Okay, the word is Trump. And as soon as you say this word to anyone, um, a variety of things will instantaneously happen. Uh, the first is that people will divide, uh, separate, based on their attitude towards that word. Um, they will have assumptions uh, that immediately get triggered. Um, they will have a variety of definitions of that word. Um, and uh, that is an example of a word that divides us. But now if we think about this for a moment, we can see that there are words that divide us and words that unite us. And this is true not only um, on a large political scale, it's true in couples. There are words that divide couples. Um, Keywords that mean something to the people who are in that relationship. Um, spendthrift, cheapskate, um, you know, sort of um, uh, always late, compulsively on time, um, neat freak, slob, um, whatever those words may happen to be, and they're particular to each couple, uh, they are words that have a history, uh, that have an emotional valence, uh, and that emotional valence then um, creates the conflict without much energy required. You just have to say the word, and that's enough to trigger the conflict. And I think all of us who have had experience with conflict over many, many years know that there are these words uh, for uh, individuals, for organizations, for, in litigation, um, uh, in um, uh, couples, even inside ourselves. So if we think now at the smallest possible scale of conflict, that is internal conflicts, um, we, and here I think we can see that we have fundamentally three scales to work with here. Um, uh, we have individual conflicts, we have relational conflicts, and we can think of uh, the third category as uh, uh, systemic conflicts, which can either be uh, in workplaces and organizations, or they can be political, institutional, etc. But they have a systemic character to them. Um, and we can now, for example, um, say that we could use this as a potential technique to figure out what the source of a conflict is. For example, uh, and I have done this, we can ask people, uh, I just did this the other day with a father and his 20-year-old um, daughter uh, who is a methamphetamine addict um, and has a brain tumor uh, but is not taking care of herself and he's sort of trying to take care of her but she's um, making things very difficult. Um, uh, so here's one e exercise. Um, ask each of them to list the words that divide them and then to list the words that unite them. Um, to ask what emotions get triggered by each of those words um, and is that how they want to feel towards each other. So now can we run this process backwards and backwards engineer a conversation from the emotions that you want to experience as a result of it? Can we design a conversation to produce an outcome? And I think the answer is yes. But now we have to get a little bit deeper into language, uh, particularly into the language of conflict in order to understand it more carefully and precisely. Uh, and uh, Jeff and Natalie, how much time do I have for this today? We uh, end promptly at nine o'clock, Ken. Okay, great. Okay, so I'll give this as a kind of opening and we'll talk about this a little bit and then we'll open it up for comments, questions, etc. 
So um, let's take a look now at language. Um, uh, and here, I think we want to break things down into a series of different categories. Um, clearly, there is a language of conflict. And for those who want to know more about this, I have it's the first chapter in a book that I wrote called The Dance of Opposites, uh, and it's called The Language of Conflict. So, and I'm not going to read from it or go into detail into it, but I'd like to give you an overview of kind of the essence of it. So, um, you can imagine now a conflicted conversation. And we can ask the question, um, if you are about to get into a conflict with someone and really have it out with them, uh, and you're about to open your mouth and say something to this person who you are an, in an antagonistic relationship with, what is likely to be the very first word out of your mouth? And the chances are good that that word will be you. And, and you in a kind of negative context, of course. So there's a negative flavor to the word you, to the tone of voice that we use to describe this. So now this is interesting. We have the very first word, the word you. What do we know about the word you? Well, we know that it's a pronoun. So now we can ask the question, what is the nature of this pronoun? And what is the nature of all pronouns? And here we can create a kind of, uh, if you can imagine uh, using a flip chart and you draw the and lines down the flip chart, dividing it into three parts. Um, the first part, you're going to list the pronoun. The second part, you're going to identify um, uh, uh, the nature of that pronoun, uh, what it essentially is. Uh, and then the third part, you're going to put in the likely consequences of using that pronoun. So if we take the word you, the form of that pronoun is an accusation. That's what it is. It's an accusation. And what are you going to get if you accuse someone of something? The answer is defense and counter accusation. You and the answer is no, I'm not. And you're worse. Okay, and now we know everything that's going to happen in that conversation. We can predict what will happen. And this, again, is the word you used in a negative context is self similar on all scales. Um, now, uh, that's one pronoun. Here's another one. Uh, and let's, let's add something to this, as in you are lazy. So there's a, clearly there's an insult in it. Now let's take um, another pronoun, they. They are lazy. Okay, now what is that? What's the form? The answer is it's a stereotype. And what are you gonna get as a result of the stereotype? The answer is prejudgment, prejudice. Um, and so we can see that automatically without anything else added. Simply using the word they in a negative context creates stereotyping. And um, that will, of course, also have a series of predictable outcomes. Nobody wants to be stereotyped. Nobody wants to be lumped, lumped together with a whole bunch of them. Uh, and they is clearly very different from us. Um, and the difference is in what the word implies in terms of permission um, uh, with regard to what can be done to them as opposed to what can be done to us. What can be done to you as opposed to what can be done to me. And now we can see that um, we have created a division uh, and along with that division we have created um, the possibility of conflict. Um, there's also he and she, uh, which are essentially similar. They're basically, you get demonization and victimization. Um, and none of these first three are at all useful. In fact, you can predict simply from the use of the very first word out of your mouth, 
most of what is going to happen and the resulting conflict. Here's an alternative, it. Now, what is the it form of you are lazy or they are lazy? The answer is the it form is there's a lot of work to be done. How should it be divided? Now, notice the difference between there's a lot of work to be done. How should it be divided? And you are lazy or they are lazy. Fundamental transformation in um, the conflict simply as a result of one word that is shifted. Um, there is also I. Uh, what is the word I? Um, the answer, I think, is that in form, it is either a confession or a request. What's the confession of you are lazy? Um, I'm working hard here. I see you taking time off. Uh, I wish I could take time off, but I don't give myself permission to do that. <clears throat> and I feel disrespected by you when I see you taking time off and I don't get a chance to. So the short answer of that is I'm jealous and I feel disrespected. Um, what's the request? Um, I need help. Can you give me a hand? Now notice the transformation that takes place simply from the shift to the word I and the use of the word I as a request rather than a confession. And now let's take a look at virtually every single thing that is said in every single conflict. And imagine that all of the accusations, <clears throat> excuse me, and all of the statements that people are making are not declaratory statements. Every one of them is a request. So uh, what is the request behind the uh, accusation? Well, when we ask this question, we can all of a sudden now discover um, that, that everybody in conflict is actually through their conflicting behaviors making a request of somebody else to behave differently. Please talk to me respectfully. Uh, please um, don't um, speak to me in, in this derogatory way. Uh, don't assume that I'm your adversary. Don't stereotype me, whatever it may happen to be. But we can phrase those as negatives and we can phrase them as you's, but we can also phrase them as I's. Um, I would appreciate it if you would. So um, there's a, 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 um, a classic mediation technique here um, that I think virtually all of you know about, uh, which is the reframing technique in which we reframe you statements as I statements. But notice we have now generated that uh, idea out of the fundamental idea of what it is um, that this communication is designed to do. And finally, there's the word they, the pronoun they. Uh, I'm sorry, the pronoun we. Uh, I mentioned they. The pronoun we. What is we? Um, the answer is it's an invitation into partnership and collaboration. Um, we have a lot of work to, be, to do. How should we divide it? Fundamentally identical to you are lazy. But um, we have now contextualized the problem as one that belongs to all of us. And we can see how this happens internally, inside of us, relationally, between us. But we can also see how it happens systemically. So notice the fundamental difference in a political environment between you statements and we statements. Um, when we talk about we, as in we are facing a pandemic, uh, the fundamental response is significantly different from when we describe it as you. Um, you have a problem. You are facing this issue, not me. Um, that is a division um, that permits um, antagonism and even invites it. All you have to do is add a little fear um, uh, and uh, this will begin to become real. So now this is the first word 
And we now can see that there is some way that we can understand this word in connection with conflict. What's the second word? Well, the second word is you are. Okay, you are lazy. What is uh, that, that? That's a verb. And what is the verb? It is the verb to be, meaning um, this is just who you are. That is frozen. That is a judgment about you and what it is that you represent. And notice what flows from that in relation to conflict. Uh, if you are uh, the problem, then the only option that I have left is to get rid of you. And now if it's a group of people, if it's blacks or Jews or Muslims or uh, uh, whoever it may happen to be, who fits into that them category, uh, you've just articulated a justification for genocide. So um, what do we do? Well, the first thing that we can do is we can imagine shifting the verb from uh, you are to you did. And notice the power of that shift. It is not that you are lazy, it is that you left work undone. Now, this focuses on behavior rather than on personality. You have all seen uh, seminars uh, about difficult people. And the problem is that if you label someone as a difficult person, the only real option available to you is to take them out and shoot them. Um, but if you label them as a difficult personality, then they need to have years of psychotherapy and even that might not work. On the other hand, if you label it as a difficult behavior, we have all engaged in difficult behaviors and will do so uh, in the future. And we are able to learn how to correct those behaviors. When we have a child, we know how to do this. We do not say, you are a bad person. We say, I don't like what you just did. Okay, so now what we are doing is we are treating the conflict not as a uh, judgment of another person and saying that the conflict is the person. We are now going right back to Fisher and Yuri, getting to yes, separate the person from the problem. And notice what follows it. Be soft on the person and hard on the problem. So what we want to do is realize that if we can be soft on the person, we can then be 10 times harder on the problem. But if we are hard on the person, our own uh, empathy and compassion rise up against us um, and block us from addressing the problem. So here is the, the kind of little magical place with regard to verbs. The verb that we choose has a consequence. And now we come to the final piece of this, which is the accusation itself. So we have three things in the sentence, uh, a pronoun, a verb, um, and an accusation. And it took me a while to figure out the accusation part because it's actually pretty complex. It's more complex than the pronoun or the verb. Those came first. But the accusation is a little bit more complicated and there's a lot more under the surface. So here I think is how we have to think about the accusation, how we describe it. Um, and here we can take again the word lazy, that's the accusation. What is contained within that word? Well, clearly there is some power and some energy in that word. What does that consist of? Uh, and here I think we need to look at beneath the surface um, in order to figure this out. Here is what I have figured out about this. And it wouldn't necessarily be obvious. It, it, we have to really think to get to a place where we can see this. Uh, point number one, every accusation is a negative, indirect statement of interests. Okay, so the word lazy means um, 
I'd like a ha some help. And what is that? That is a statement of interest, but it isn't phrased as a statement of interest positively or directly. Instead, it's presented negatively and indirectly, which is confusing and also provocative. Uh, it provokes the other side to respond negatively and indirectly as well. Why do we do it? Because asking for what we want makes us vulnerable and requires us uh, to experience um, openness um, uh, to another person who could hurt us. So to protect ourselves, we frame it negatively and indirectly. Second, every accusation is a negative, indirect statement of emotion. That is, the word lazy is actually um, a kind of, we now use the word dog whistle um, uh, as a, a, a way of indicating that people are behaving in a, in a way that is racist. Um, well, it's a kind of dog whistle, meaning that it's below the level of ordinary hearing, uh, but every dog can hear it. Uh, you can understand what it is that you're being asked to do. Um, and so um, the underlying emotion um, can be addressed directly and positively. Simply, for example, by asking the question, um, uh, uh, what are you experiencing right now and how would you like to communicate that to the other person as a request or as a statement of how it feels to you or however you want to do this. But notice that each one of these interventions, uh, each one of these analyses gives rise to a different kind of intervention. So um, the um, uh, 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 underneath the uh, emotional experience of working hard and not having your work appreciated by another person um, is a complex set of emotions that are difficult to untangle. Um, they're emotions of caring about what the other person feels, uh, emotions of shame and humiliation, um, uh, about being treated in this way and not being cared about, uh, emo a, a whole series of things, jealousy, etc. Um, and here what we can see is that these unspoken emotions that have been turned uh, negative and indirect um, uh, make it uh, much more difficult to handle the conflict and to deal with it than if we could talk about what it is that is really going on. Um, and um, now we're not quite done yet because there are still some deeper issues. And here, if we want to think about it, we have to look at a, a places where uh, something is taking place beneath the surface that becomes obvious when we look at it, where it's not obvious in other circles. So for example, in organizational uh, issues, in litigated cases, um, this uh, sort of a set of twisted emotions, uh, kind of strangled emotions, um, don't always um, uh, get acknowledged or recognized. Um, but you just have to ask the question, do people have emotional responses to money? And the answer will be absolutely. Um, are they upset when it is taken away from them? Of course they are. Are they happy when they receive it? Yes. Now, uh, all we have to do is to see that money is not um, an unemotional subject. And we can then begin to see that one of the places that people get stuck uh, is around the inability uh, to even talk about what money means to them. Um, uh, but now we, let's take, if we take a look instead, not at a litigated case or at an organizational or institutional or political case, if we just take a look at what happens in a marriage, in a family, uh, between two people in a couple, um, 
how exactly does this manifest itself? Well, you see, we see uh, insults and accusations all the time. Uh, not just you are lazy, but the other ones that I mentioned and a whole bunch of others that we could all come up with. Um, but, uh, and once again, we can see that there is underneath this uh, a request, but there is something else that is uh, driving it. And I would say from my experience, having done probably tens of thousands of divorces uh, and marital mediations, uh, that underneath it, is uh, a deep-seated relational fear. Now, let's go back to you are lazy. What is underneath that? What is the uh, fundamental statement underneath that? Well, one is you don't respect me. But now, um, if we ask the question of someone in the middle of this argument, what does it mean to you that he doesn't respect you? the answer that you are likely to get is, it means he doesn't love me. Now, is that serious? Oh yeah. Is it deep? Yes. Is it likely, therefore, to be influencing the conversation in under, uh, unclear ways and unexpected ways? The answer is yes, absolutely. Uh, and now, can we talk about that? Can we surface that issue and bring it out into the open and work on it together? For example, uh, turning to him, um, is, it, is that true? Do you not love her? See what he says. Maybe his answer is yes, I don't. But likely, uh, it's likely that he'll respond by saying, no, no, I do love you. And that's not what this is really about. Well, that helps because if you are, have a conversation in a context and we haven't yet discussed the issue of context. Uh, but we ha if you have an argument in the context of a loving and caring relationship, you handle it very differently than if the context is one of um, bitterness and resentment uh, and fear um, and rage uh, or whatever it may happen to be. And there is a final place where the accusation is given a special little spin. Uh, and if you ask the question, again, you are lazy, what's underneath that? Well, there's an issue of lack of respect and what's underneath that uh, is the issue of, and here we've got the interest, underlying interest and the emotional responses to that. And now a deep-seated uh, relational fear, which is that the other person doesn't actually love me. And beneath that is a deep-seated self-doubt which takes the form of, I am unlovable. I don't deserve to be treated fairly. Now this is way, way, way below the surface, but, I, but it is nonetheless there. Um, because if you are in fact completely confident about being lovable, um, some of these conflicts will not occur to you at all. They will not appear to you as conflict, simply as disagreements. But if you have that there, if that is in place, then you will have a much more serious response to this conflict. So now we can see that we've taken this very, very simple statement and we can feed in any set of statements and we have created um, uh, a kind of subtext, um, uh, a set of interpretations. Um, uh, that um, may be guiding this conversation in ways that we do not understand. And now what we have to do is we have to go to the next higher level, which is we've started with a word and then we've gone to a sentence, and now we can go to a story. And we can look at stories and narratives and how we construct stories and narratives uh, about our conflict. A story is about something that happened. A narrative is really about the person uh, who did it. And in every organization, in every relationship, whether it's a work relationship or uh, a personal relationship, we have stories about each other and we have narratives. The narrative, for example, is how your family saw you as you were growing up. That was a narrative. 
oh, well, she's the one who does this, or he's the one who is this. That's a narrative. And now what we have to see is that a part of the work of conflict resolution is to deconstruct the narrative, to transform the stories, to shift the, um, uh, reframe the, the, the words and the, uh, and the sentences, the, the pronouns, the verbs, the, uh, the accusations. We're looking for ways essentially of giving people some perspective on uh, what it is that they are doing and what it actually means to them at whatever level of depth that meaning exists at. Now that means that sometimes things will not be particularly deep. Uh, as Freud said, sometimes a cigar is just a cigar. So you don't have to go very deep in order to understand that. Um, and sometimes something happens that isn't particularly Again, what happens is it just, uh, uh, it's like a flash, it goes away quickly, it disappears. And at other times, uh, it becomes chronic. It repeats over and over again. It becomes a wound and the wound begins to fester. Um, and people begin to slip into uh, a, a kind of negative intimacy in their relationship with each other. So. Um, how do we deconstruct narratives? How do we transform stories? And I think that there are a number of answers to these, and I've written about this as well also in this book, uh, The Dance of Opposites. Um, but one of the things that we can do, for example, um, is to search for the third story. Uh, William Urey has a book called The Third Side, a really, really brilliant book. Um, and what it describes is the search for the third option. Now here we have a choice and we can see this choice quite clearly, for example, in political conflicts, but we can also see it in litigated cases, organizational disputes, uh, even in marriages and families, uh, community disputes. Um, yes, so the, the, uh, the basic idea is about the middle and the two forms of middle ground um, uh, the lower, there's a lower middle and a higher middle. In other words, is me, because mediators are searching for the middle. Uh, the lower middle is compromise, which we all know about. We take two sums, add them together and divide by two. Very simple. Um, but there is a higher middle ground. Uh, if we, if we take the first middle ground, let's say that we, here's how it works. Um, you take hot water and cold water and add them together and you get lukewarm water. Here's what the higher ground is. You take water and add flour and yeast and heat and make bread. And the bread has nothing in common superficially with the water or the heat or the flour or the yeast. It's something new that emerges out of the creative combination of those other ingredients in the right proportions. Um, and that's what I see us as. I see us as trying to create bread. Um, the search for the higher middle ground, for the middle ground that actually isn't just um, a convenient place. Where Hi, can you hear me? Yes, thank you, Kim. Okay, I'm so sorry about this. I don't know exactly what's happening, so we must be having a problem with the um, with the internet here. Um, uh, well, that basically that was uh, in in the time that's remaining. I'd like to open it up and see whether there are uh, comments, questions, issues, difficulties, uh, problems that people have, and I'm going to try and get back on visually as well. So, Ken, let me start with a question, which is um, something that I have noticed over so many times in my career as a mediator in terms of the difference between a higher middle ground and lower middle ground of compromise, as you call it. As I sit there as a mediator and I think, oh gosh, there's tremendous possibilities for collaboration, future orientation, how splendid this would be if only they would do this, that, and the other thing. But they don't seem interested in it. 
It's not their idea. They're just there to cut a deal. And there's a kind of internal mm -hmm. frustration that that I feel when there's opportunities for gain that it just, you know, there just doesn't seem to be any, any interest in it. What do you, what, what do we do in those situations? Well, I think there are two responses. Um, we have to figure out why there is no interest in it. Uh, and one reason may be because of the fact that there is no ongoing relationship between people uh, um, and uh, the the absence of an ongoing relationship means that they've got other issues that are priorities for them and um, if they're going to try to figure out what they're doing wrong they want to do it with somebody else I think that's a legitimate um, response and one that we don't have to worry too much about uh, if it's you know if you're you're renting a car and you're having a conflict with the person who is the service representative behind the counter, um, you don't want to spend a couple of hours figuring out how you're going to interact or relate with each other. Um, uh, but on the other hand, if the, the reason uh, is because of the fact that you are defended um, uh, inside yourself against whatever it is that the other person is saying or um, you have been unskillful, and figuring out how to say it, then the goal, uh, I think, for each of us is to figure out what we can learn from this conflict. And maybe that is the appropriate question. Uh, what is one thing that you could learn from this conflict? Um, one skill that you could use um, uh, uh, in future conflicts? Oh, here we are. I'm, it looks like I'm coming up again on the video. Uh. So yes, uh, we, I don't. Uh, here's I think a, a different way of looking at it. Um, for us as mediators, we know that every little conflict that we experience in our lives is an opportunity for us uh, to get better, not only in our professional lives, but to become better human beings. Um, and if we look at it in that way, we are likely then to discover. Uh, a part of what that conflict took place in order to teach us. And here's my basic approach to it. Um, we are all evolving um, as human beings and a part of what prevents us from evolving is conflict. Therefore, if we can figure out how to resolve the conflict that we are facing right now, we will be able to figure out how to advance in our own lives and handle not just that conflict, but all similar kinds of conflict uh, from of whatever source, from whatever uh, uh, location. Um, and I think of this as the crossroads of conflict. So every conflict that we experience uh, takes place at a crossroads that is defined on the one hand by a problem we are now required to solve and on the other hand, by the fact that we do not yet have the skills we need in order to solve it. So if we could acquire those skills, wouldn't we be happier? Wouldn't we be better human beings? Wouldn't everybody? Um, and therefore, everyone, every conflict that we face is just an opportunity for growth and learning um, and self-development. Now that's pretty profound. Um, pretty amazing and that is our spiritual mission if I can put it that way uh, I believe that we have that spiritual mission uh, which is not a religious mission uh, it is a deeply uh, human uh, mission to try to help people figure out how they could live their lives more fully more happily um, more pleasantly more collaboratively and that's a <clears throat> such a beautiful thought that we're going to end on it because <laughs> our time our time unfortunately is up. Uh, as all the other talk show hosts say to their guests, Ken, will you please come back and join us again soon? Of course. Of course. That's, that's, you, you both. Actually, thank you to all of you for doing this work that you're doing and contributing uh, to people who we uh, know are in much greater need than we are. Yes, and Ken, thank you also so much for mentioning the 
uh, two food banks at the beginning, the Santa Monica Ocean Park Neighborhood Food Bank, which is www.opcc.net, and the food bank, food bank in the Sandpoint, Idaho area, uh, which Natalie has also posted in the chat, foodbank83864.com. That's foodbank83864.com. For those listening live or listening to the recording, which will be posted on LinkedIn and elsewhere, if you're in a financial position to be able to contribute to either or both of those food banks, very much appreciated. Natalie, any final words? Tim, thank you so much for uh, speaking with us today. You know, um, you and I have been friends for a couple of uh, decades now, and I'm always inspired, always moved by um, your thoughts, your contributions. Um, I really, really appreciate your efforts. Thank you. Amen. Natalie, thank you so much for organizing the Will Work for Food project. Thanks to everybody for being here and listening and putting up with our technological uh, issues. Ken, most of all, thank you so much. You're, uh, you always, uh, we always have high expectations of you and you always exceed them, my friend. Thank you very much. And with that, we are complete. We'll see you next year. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Happy New Year. Happy New Year one and all.